When I married Jillian, or Jill as she preferred to be called, I had no idea about the nightmare that would unfold. My name is Tony Rowan, as I mentioned before, and my wife's name is Jill. When we got married, I was sure we would grow old together and enjoy our grandchildren. I started my own business as a consulting engineer two years after we got married, and Jill worked for a small medical supplies company. Welcome to the Dark Side channel. Dive into the world of human relationships, mistakes, and right decisions. Don't miss out. Subscribe and join our growing community. We both agreed to settle down and save some money before starting a family. For eight years we were happy, and our intimate life was great. I honestly thought I had married the perfect woman. I bought a small cottage on a quiet lane. It needed a lot of interior work, but structurally it was sound. Our nearest neighbor was 200 yards away, and there were only six other houses on the lane. It took almost a year, and the house was finally finished, most of the work done by ourselves. I had to hire workers for some plumbing and electrical tasks. I was glad the work was done, and Jill and I often talked about how perfect it would be when we finally had children. Everything went wrong just before our ninth anniversary. Jill often became very sharp with me, adding to the fact that our intimate life was almost dead, and her attitude started to annoy me. Jill began going out several evenings a week with the girls from work, or so she said. Wherever they went, it must have been good because she never came home before midnight. I started to think the worst, but reasoned that she would never cheat on me, though I had no idea how wrong I was. I had a childhood friend whom I turned to for advice. Barry Patton and I had been friends since we met in the first grade. When my company expanded and I needed an executive director, I turned to Barry because he was someone I could trust. Barry knew Jill and initially couldn't believe what I was telling him, but after hearing the details, he changed his mind. All the signs are there, Tony. If you want my opinion, I think Jill is cheating on you. Sorry to break the bad news, but I'd bet my career on it. When Barry said that, I knew he wasn't joking. I thanked him and went back to my office. I sat at my desk, pondering how to handle the situation. If Jill was cheating, then it was over. Our marriage was done. The bad part was that she would get half of everything I owned. I searched for a private investigator and found one who could meet me later that day. When I explained my concerns to Joe Ames, the private detective, he assured me that if Jill was cheating, he would get the evidence I needed. I left his office feeling a bit better. Deep down, I hoped and prayed that I was wasting my money on his services. The next day, I met with a technician at the cottage so he could install several hidden cameras. He also hooked up a voice recorder to the phone line. I didn't think it would reveal much. Jill wasn't stupid enough to use the home phone if she was cheating. A week later, I contacted Joe, and the news was revolting. It's all in the report and the DVD is very explicit. If I were you, I wouldn't watch it. Knowing is one thing, but seeing it is a whole different game. Thanking Joe for the advice, I paid his final fee and left with the report and DVD. Back in my office, I didn't heed Joe's advice and watched the DVD. The report showed that her so-called outings with the girls were a cover for fooling around with some jerk she worked with. They took several long lunches and half days off to go and do it at a motel a few miles away. The report also mentioned that they went to his place a few times. The DVD was recorded on a Thursday. Jill came home during the day with a man, and they immediately went to the bedroom and did it like wild animals for several hours. Jill did everything for him. What really shocked and disgusted me was hearing Jill say to her lover, I need to meet up with you and the guys again. What we have is great, but all those big toys are heaven. I had never met the guy she was sleeping with, but there wasn't much to choose between him and me. I was a decent twenty. We were both about the same age and build. With the evidence in hand, I planned to catch them at the cottage, beat the crap out of him, and throw Jill out on the street. The next Thursday, I left work early and drove past our place, and sure enough, Jill's car and another one I didn't recognize were parked in the driveway. I parked on the street and headed to my house. As soon as I walked in, I could hear them upstairs having a wild romp. I burst into the bedroom and yelled at the jerk to get out of my house. 
That turned out to be a bad move because this was a different jerk. The guy was well over six feet tall and must have weighed a hundred pounds more than me. I saw him coming toward me and then everything went black. When I came to, I was tied to a chair with a gag in my mouth. Jill was on the bed with three guys screaming. Eventually, one of them noticed I was awake. Hey, look, the little weakling woke up. They all laughed. I watched as Jill disentangled herself from the mass of bodies on the bed and walked over to where I was sitting. The woman I married stood there, smiling, her face flushed. She pulled the gag from my mouth. Why, Jill? Why do this to us? I realized being married to you was boring. I want to have fun, and all you care about is kids and a wife at home looking after you. Well, that's not happening. You thought you could barge in and ruin my fun, didn't you? Jill stared at me with a twisted smile on her face. As you can see, I have three real men here satisfying me, so I don't need you anymore. Now that we're done, my friends are going to take you somewhere. I hope you like it. I didn't recognize the woman standing in front of me. This was not my wife. Jill wouldn't do this to me, right? One of the guys came over and hit me hard in the face, and the lights went out again. When I stirred, it was dark, and it took me a few seconds to get my bearings. I knew I was lying on my side with my wrists and ankles bound, and there was a hood over my head. The movement told me I was in a vehicle, and judging by the cold metal floor, I guessed it was some kind of van. Looks like he's waking up again. Good. That saves us from having to drag him. We're almost there. I was jostled around as the vehicle drove over bumpy roads or dirt tracks. My head hurt from the earlier blow, and I was relieved when the vehicle finally stopped. Little did I know, it would have been better if they kept driving. Untie his legs. At least he can walk the last few steps. The last few steps. It suddenly hit me that they were about to kill me. Or so I thought. I was led over rough ground, nearly tripping several times. Get up. I'm not carrying you. Now move, you motherfucker. The voice instructed me as a hand smacked the back of my head. I silently prayed that whatever they were about to do would be quick, and if this was my fate, to end it soon. I stood waiting to hear the click of a gun being cocked, the hood over my head preventing me from seeing anything. Suddenly they started kicking and punching me, and I fell to the ground. The blows kept coming until my battered body lay still. I knew I was still alive, barely, but alive. I felt someone's hand touch my neck, fingers gently moving around. No pulse. Should we bury him or leave him here? Screw it, leave him here. There's no one around for miles, and if his body's ever found, there won't be much left of him anyway. If the guy checking me knew what he was doing, he would have found my pulse. But where his fingers touched my neck, he didn't stand a chance. I heard my attackers laughing as they walked away. I lay still, thinking it was for several hours, but it was probably only ten minutes or so. I didn't move until I heard the distant sound of their car driving away. As I lay there, I wondered what had made Jill hate me so much. What had turned her into someone who loved those big toys? I had always treated her right. I remembered her comment about my small size. Pain shot through my body when I tried to stand. It took several attempts since my wrists were bound. Finally, I managed to get up, my body aching as if a truck had hit me. I knew the first thing I needed to do was try to get the hood off my head. Wandering around in complete darkness was not an option. Moving slowly, I stumbled into a bush or something similar and pressed my head against it, trying to snag the hood. Eventually it caught, and I was able to free myself from it. My eyes adjusted to the different darkness. Honestly, my left eye was swollen shut, and I hoped the damage wasn't permanent. Once my eyes adjusted, I realized I had no idea where I was. All I knew was that I'd been left in a forest or dense thicket. Slowly, I moved in the direction that seemed easiest to navigate. I wasn't in any shape to climb up after any fall. I wasn't a former military guy or anything, just a regular guy who didn't want to die. It took everything I had left just to keep moving in one direction. After a while, still in a lot of pain, I noticed a light in the distance. As I got closer to the light source, I realized it was a cottage or farmhouse, and I found enough energy to make it to the gate. Attempting to open it was beyond my strength, so I shouted, and suddenly everything went dark again. 
When I managed to open my eyes, my left one still swollen shut, I saw that I was in a room. I tried to sit up, but the pain was too much, and I flopped back down. Please don't move. Clearly you've had an accident or something. I looked up and saw a woman standing over me. Who are you? How did I get here? I found you near my house last night. I heard your shout, and when I looked around, you were lying unconscious on the ground. I remembered trying to open the gate. Now lie still and tell me what happened if you can remember. Oh, I remembered everything clearly. I just wasn't sure if I should discuss it with this stranger. My name is Rosemary, but you can call me Rosie. I prefer it. So how on earth did you end up in this state? It's a long story, and I'm not sure I should tell you. My ribs ached every time I tried to speak or breathe heavily. Should we call the police? No, please, no police. I promise I won't harm you, and will tell you what happened, just not right now. Rosie smiled, and I must have passed out again because I remembered nothing after that. When I woke up next, Rosie was in the room, and this time I managed to sit up. Rosie fluffed a couple of pillows so I could sit comfortably. I noticed my torso was wrapped in bandages, and I had several cuts on my arms and legs. Do you have a mirror? Rosie nodded and handed me a small mirror. I almost dropped it when I saw my reflection. My lips were cut and swollen. My left eye was blackened and swollen shut. My right eye was badly bruised, and I had several more cuts on my face. Now are you ready to tell me who you are and what happened? I nodded. I told Rosie everything I could remember, starting from catching Jill in bed with three men to my attempt to open her gate. Tony, you really should call the police, you know. No, please don't. I'll handle this my way and in my own time. The last thing I need is the police getting involved. Have it your way and do what you must. Now I don't know where you live or anything, so you'd better stay here until you're mobile and healthy enough to leave. I thanked Rosie for her kindness. I had no idea who this woman was. I guess she was about 45, a good 10 years older than me. Rosie allowed me to use her phone to call Barry and let him know I was okay. Tony, where the hell have you been? Everyone's going crazy trying to find you. Jill was here, terribly worried that you were missing. Barry, do me a favor, please. If Jill asks, you haven't heard anything from me. I promise I'll explain everything when we meet next. If anything comes up at work, I trust you to handle it. I ended the call and Barry seemed satisfied. Rosie asked me what my plans were. I'm going to rest until I can move and get back home. After that... I'm going to make some people pay for everything. I don't know how yet, but they will pay. Rosie just nodded and smiled. Do what you must, Tony, but please, be careful. Suddenly it dawned on me that aside from knowing her name, I knew nothing about Rosie. And come to think of it, I had no idea where I was. When Rosie told me the name of the nearest village, I estimated I must be at least three hours away from home. Rosie fed and cared for me, and only after a few weeks did I feel well enough to leave. I told Rosie that I would call someone to pick me up. I'll drop you off at the train station in the village. Whoever you call will never find this place. It's too remote. I struggled to get into Rosie's small car, a testament to the fact that I still wasn't fully recovered. I thanked Rosie for everything. Her response was simple. Do what you must, Tony, but please be careful. I sat and waited for Barry to pick me up. Jesus Christ, Tony, what the hell happened to you? Barry exclaimed when he arrived. On the way back, I told Barry everything. He shook his head in disbelief. I think I know why she did it, Barry. If we get divorced, she gets half of everything. Jill is greedy and wants it all. I bet she promised her buddies a lot of cash if they got rid of me. She knows the company is worth millions. I think she'd sell it off and spend her days sleeping with whoever she wants. You can stay at my place, buddy. If anyone asks, I'll say I have no idea where you are. Thanks, Barry. Do me a favor, please. Bring my laptop from the office. Oh, and I'll need some clothes. Barry laughed and said he felt like he was harboring a fugitive. Not yet, but it might happen if I get caught exacting my revenge. Well, then you better not get caught. I don't want to know what you're planning. On the way, we stopped at a shopping center. I managed to get some jeans, t-shirts, socks, underwear, and a pair of sneakers. For now, that was plenty. I had a full wardrobe at home, or at least I hoped I did. Fortunately, 
When we arrived at Barry's house, it was dark, and I could only imagine what the neighbors would say about me. According to Barry, Jill played the role of the loving wife very well. She called everyone who knew me, everyone except the police. She called Barry regularly, every day, asking if he had heard from me. Naturally, his answer was always negative. Gradually, I recovered and could walk without much pain. Barry told me that Jill's calls had now reduced to once a week. I guess she was too busy enjoying herself to worry about me. Sometimes, having time to think can be beneficial. In my case, it led to contemplating how terrible my revenge would be. I wanted true retribution and analyze my options. Sitting idle all day, I came up with several ways to deal with Jill and her buddies. The problem was that most of my ideas involved someone else. That was something I wasn't ready for. My hatred led me to what's known as the dark web. After some reading, it became clear that I could hire a hitman if I wanted. There were several references to mechanics, a term in the dark web for hired killers. Eventually I had a plan but had no idea how to make it a reality. And out of desperation and hatred, I left a message asking for help with a chemical problem. Naturally, I got several messages from some nutcases, but there was one that seemed to understand where I was going. I replied to his message. After a few more exchanges, I was convinced the guy was genuine. He seemed satisfied that I wasn't law enforcement. He sent me a program to install, which encrypted our messages. After logging out and closing the VPN software, I searched the internet for what he advised me to acquire, as I needed specific brand names. It took a bit longer than expected. Once I had everything I needed, I realized that for this to work, I had to know when Jill and her lovers would be in the house. Returning to the internet, I bought some listening devices bugs. Most evenings, Barry and I sat and talked. He never asked what I was planning, and I never told him. Business was doing well, and the company had attracted several new clients. I assured Barry that I'd likely return to the office in a week or two. When the bugs arrived, I went back to the house. Jill's car was in the driveway. Maybe she had a quiet night last night. I didn't know, and I didn't care. I watched Jill leave the house and went inside five minutes later. Thank God it hadn't occurred to her to change the locks. She must have been confident I was dead. So there was no need to worry. I placed a bug in the living room and one in the bedroom. Despite having men in the house, it was clean and tidy. Fresh sheets were on the bed with no signs of anyone else being there. That evening, I heard Jill talking to a man. I recognized the voice of one of the men from the van. He was there, slept with Jill, and informed her that he had arranged with the others for Friday evening. Oh God, I love you. How many will be here? Jill asked. I managed to convince nine guys. It would have been ten, but one can't make it this week. Nine will be enough. I shut my laptop. I didn't need to hear them fooling around. I hoped he enjoyed it because if my plan worked, after Friday, no one would be with Jill anymore. On Friday evening, I sat in the bushes across from our house, waiting for the start of the fuck fest. Finally, Jill arrived home, accompanied by several other cars following her. I gave them thirty minutes, reasoning that it was enough time for them to get started, then slowly made my way to the back door. I heard the noise upstairs. Jill was screaming, and everyone else was cheering her on. I quietly made my way upstairs, pausing to ensure everyone was in the bedroom. I poured the first liquid on the carpet, leaving a trail back to the kitchen, then repeated the process with the second liquid. The person who explained this to me was right about one thing. When mixed together, the smell was barely noticeable. He warned me that the more I used, the stronger the final result. Returning to the kitchen, I faced the tricky part. If I messed this up, we'd all be going to hell. The third liquid was essentially the trigger. Once it mixed with the others and reacted, all hell would break loose. I poured the liquid into a puddle near the other two. I figured it would take a few minutes for them to meet. Slowly and silently, I exited through the door, quietly closing it behind me. I sprinted down the path to where I had parked the rental car. As I drove away, I saw a powerful, bright flash in the rearview mirror. I didn't stop. I just kept driving until I reached Barry's house. Luckily, Barry had a date and wasn't home when I arrived. I took a shower and went to bed. The next morning, I drove to the house. 
I acted like I wanted to let Jill know I was alive despite her friend's efforts. Another part of the act was to gather my clothes and some personal belongings, although I knew they were all burned. When I turned into the lane, I was stopped by a police officer. Sorry, sir. You can't go any further. But I live here, just down the road at Laurel Cottage. Park your car and wait here, please. The officer walked to the cottage. A few moments later, he returned with a man in a suit. Mr. Rowan, I'm Detective Inspector Hobson. Do you mind if I ask where you were last night? I was home. Well, actually, I'm staying with a friend. My wife and I are separated. How long have you been staying with this friend? A couple of months. I just came to collect the last of my clothes and personal items. Unfortunately, there was a fire at the cottage last night. Can I take a look? I mean, after all, it's my house. Or at least it was. We walked down the path together, with the detective asking me more questions. Did I store any flammable materials at home? No, not at all. There was a small gasoline can in the shed that I used to fuel my lawnmower. The cottage was a complete wreck. One end of the wall had collapsed, the roof had sagged at an awkward angle. As you can see, sir, the fire destroyed the building. No one is allowed inside except firefighters and rescue workers. They are currently retrieving the bodies. Did your wife have friends over last night? I have no idea. As I said, we're separated, and I don't know what she was doing last night. You said they're retrieving bodies. How many are there? So far, ten. They believe that's all of them, but are making sure. I stood there looking shocked, as anyone in my position would. I thanked the detective and walked back to my car. When I was a few miles away, I called Barry. I explained the situation, and Barry assured me he would confirm we were home all night. Naturally, I was questioned about the fire. I told the police that Jill and I were separated and that I was staying with Barry until things were sorted out. The fire investigation concluded after two months, and it was ruled an accident, likely caused by a faulty gas appliance. The coroner recorded accidental death verdicts for those who died in the fire, one woman and nine men. In my statement, I suggested Jill was probably having a party with some colleagues from work, as we were separated and I had no better explanation. I attended Jill's funeral more for appearance's sake than anything else, and as the coffin was lowered into the ground, I threw in a handful of dirt and a single rose. Attached to the stem of the rose was a card. I had written on it, Burn in hell, bitch. Most of the attendees probably thought it was a personal gesture of love. Yeah, right, as if it could be that. Jill's mother did ask me why I wasn't home that night and what Jill was doing in the house with nine men. We were separated, waiting for a divorce. As for why she had nine men in the house, you figure it out. I turned and walked away. I moved out of Barry's place into a small furnished apartment. The only significant loss was having to replace my entire wardrobe. Eventually, the insurance company paid out for the house, and I sold the plot to a developer, as I had no desire to rebuild. The media speculated about why there were nine men and one woman in the house that night. I didn't comment and let people draw their own conclusions. As for the nine men, I didn't know any of them and paid no attention to the newspaper reports about their funerals. I tried to return to thank Rosie for saving me. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the cottage, despite asking some locals where it was located. Barry never asked me about the fire. He did suggest setting me up on a date if I was interested. Right now, I just want to continue with my life, especially since there is a woman who lives in the same apartment building as I do. We haven't had a proper conversation yet, aside from exchanging greetings. If we do start dating and things become serious, a prenuptial agreement will be signed before I get married again. I had a lot of time to reflect on everything that had happened. Sometimes, late at night, the events would replay in my mind, making it difficult to sleep. Therapy helped, but the memories were still there, lurking in the shadows. Moving forward wasn't easy, but it was necessary. Barry, always the supportive friend, continued to encourage me. He suggested various hobbies and activities to keep my mind occupied. I took up running, which surprisingly helped clear my head. The physical exertion was a welcome distraction from the chaos of my thoughts. The woman in my apartment building, her name is Laura, began to show more interest in me. 
We started with casual conversations in the hallway, which eventually led to coffee dates. She was kind and understanding, a stark contrast to the turmoil I had experienced with Jill. I found myself looking forward to our time together. Despite my growing feelings for Laura, I remained cautious. The scars from my previous relationship were still fresh. I discussed my concerns with Barry, who reassured me that it was okay to take things slow. Laura seemed to understand my hesitation and never pressured me for more than I was ready to give. One evening, as Laura and I walked through the park, I decided to share a bit of my past with her. She listened intently, never interrupting, just offering silent support. When I finished, she took my hand and simply said, Thank you for trusting me with this. Her reaction made me realize that not everyone was like Jill, and maybe, just maybe, I could find happiness again. As our relationship deepened, the idea of marriage surfaced. This time, I was adamant about having a prenuptial agreement. Laura respected my decision, and we had an open discussion about it. It was clear that we both valued honesty and transparency, which only strengthened our bond. Life slowly began to take on a new normal. The nightmares became less frequent, and I started to find joy in the little things again. Laura and I continued to build a life together one step at a time. Barry remained a constant in my life, always there with a word of advice or a joke to lighten the mood. Looking back, it was hard to believe how much had changed. From the depths of betrayal and anger, I had managed to find a glimmer of hope. Rosie's act of kindness, Barry's unwavering support, and Laura's gentle patience had all played a part in my healing process. In the end, I realized that while the past would always be a part of me, it didn't have to define my future. With the right people by my side, I could move forward and create a new chapter in my life, one filled with love, trust, and genuine happiness.